Grab your Bibles real quick and turn with me to the book of Genesis. Chapter number 7. If you love the Lord today, say amen. amen. Genesis chapter number 7. And verse number 13. Thank you. Your Bible said, In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after his kind and every creeping thing that creepeth unto the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. Verse 15. And they went in unto Noah, and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh. Watch this. As God had commanded him, I want to preach on these next few words. And the Lord shut him in. Noah is responsible to operate off of the architecture that God gave him concerning the ark. They made it out of gopher wood. Noah was responsible for a whole lot, but once the ark was done and all the animals were on board, the Bible says that Noah's job was done, the hand of God took that door and shut the door. With the help of the Lord for just a few minutes this morning, I want to preach on the ministry of closed doors. You can be seated. The ministry of closed doors. We rejoice over God being so good to us that he opens new doors. Somebody in the church gets a job promotion or you get called up to another level and God opens a door for you to walk through. And man, you're going to call me preacher. Thank you for praying. God answered my prayers. God answered our prayers. God opened a door. But I'm here to submit to you today that we should be just as grateful and thankful when God shuts a door as when he opens a door. I was a teenager, and every summer of my life, uh, in right after baseball season, mom and them would load us up with friends, and we would all go vacation in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. This one year in specific, I was probably 14, 13, 14 years old. You know them years where you start thinking that you're too cool to handle, too hot to handle. I mean, just got everything going on. I had a gap between my teeth that wide. My hair was all put, but you know, but man, I, I remember there was some, we, we were, our, our, our condo we were staying at that year was on the second floor, right overlooking the pool area of the condo that mom and daddy had, had, had reached. There was a couple girls, me and my friend's age, that we, Becky, this is for you, come around, so don't get mad at me, but we was flirting with these girls that was a couple doors down from us, and they were down there at the pool, and we, it was about midweek in that trip, and uh, I seen them girls down there at the, it was dark, dark time outside, and uh, we, we were about to go, to, we had just come back from dinner, and they were out there, and they were asking us to come walk with them, and uh, one of the girls said, do you have anything to drink up there? And I thought, hallelujah, I'll go get her a Coca-Cola and she'll love me even more. <clears throat> I said, hold on just a second, girl. I'll go get you a Coke. I ran back into the condo to grab the Coke. I'm 
running with everything I have trying to, uh, I don't know, whatever, but I'm getting that Coke. And I, I remember sprinting from that refrigerator back to the balcony of that condo trying to get that Coke to that girl's hands. The, 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 the encasement that led out to that condo is visible for the entire pool area to see. I am running as fast as I possibly can trying to get back to that condo to throw the said girl who was nowhere near as pretty as Becky was. <laughs> I'm on dangerous waters. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta watch with me. <laughs> I'm running to that condo, and I'll never forget as long as I live. <sighs> and all of a sudden, everything blacked out. Somebody, while I was at the refrigerator, had shut that sliding glass door back. <laughs> and with every bit of energy I had, I ran full-faced. And if anybody's ever seen me, Becky makes fun of me because I go head first. I'm always like this. So that meant my head hit that glass door first and knocked me out cold. I woke up to mom and dad on top trying to wake me up and all them people laughing at me out there on the outside. Have you ever felt like a door got closed on you that you didn't close? If you live long enough, you're going to know what it's like to rejoice over open doors. And you're also going to know what it's like to feel the shame and the regret and the pain and the rejection of doors getting closed on you. As a 42-year-old man, I've not lived as long as many in this room, but I've lived long enough to know what the pain of rejection feels like because of doors that were closed, not by me, but by other people. And if we're not careful, we'll worship God over open doors and get mad at God over closed doors. But I got to tell you that it is the Lord that shuts the doors. The Bible is very clear. In Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 7, He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I believe that every child of God, every Christian here can make it through your closed door situations by recognizing the, the ministries of closed door situations. Number one, if we'll look at our text, we'll see in verse number, chapter number six, verses five through eight, we see that this closing of the door in the life of Noah and his family, number one, if you're taking notes, it separated them from the wickedness on the outside. This closed door separated them from the wickedness that was on the outside. Chapter number six, verses five through eight, go with me today. The Bible said, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see that this shutting of the door, it was number one separating them from the wickedness that was around them. We see, uh, first of all, under this, that there were teasers that were present. Could you imagine being a part of Noah's family? God tells Noah to build an ark. It has never rained. It has never dewed. None, none of those kind of things have taken place. There's never been this rainstorm of any kind of way uh, that, that Noah is preaching about. All the people in that community are wicked and carnal. They're making fun of Noah. They're making fun of Noah's kids and saying, say, it's never rained before. Why would you all do this? This is crazy. Y'all are a part of a crazy people. What, are you, what would y'all do all of this for? There were teasers that were 
at present. Uh, but when we, we see this separation of the wicked, the Bible it talks about the wickedness in the days of Noah. Matter of fact, if you go to the New Testament, go to the book of Revelation, you'll find it says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Many things that were happening in the day of Noah, the Bible said would be happening and going on right before our eyes in the day and hour when Jesus comes back to get his bride. I don't come to preach on this today, but listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. I believe before we ever see Monday, Jesus could split the skies wide open and come back after his bride. I'm not looking for a sign. I'm listening for a shout. And what a joy it is to know that one of these days, God's going to open a door and he's going to shut a door on the people of God. And we'll rejoice as we say goodbye to a world of sin. And God will separate us from the wickedness that is to come. But, 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 but as we look towards that day, we also must learn to give God glory and praise and honor that he is a God that in our lives he has shut some doors that has separated us from the wickedness of this world. I am so thankful to be able to go back in my mind and remember the good glad day when God saved my soul. The day that my name was recorded in the Lamb's book of life. The day that hell got evicted from my soul and the day that the Holy Ghost, I said the Holy Ghost, I said the Holy Ghost moved and took up residence on the inside of my heart. That day more happened than me just getting a ticket to heaven. But that day I had, there was a power that was placed in my life to overcome and defeat sin. I don't have to be bound and, and toyed around by the powers of sin, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God and in this day and hour I'm thankful that the door was shut in my life I have not been perfect since I got saved can I get a witness I have not had it all together since I've been saved can I get a hallelujah but at the end of the day you've got to be able to go back in your mind and remember a day when heaven shut the door on that sinful lifestyle that once dominated your life and now you found joy unspeakable and full of glory. God is your father. Heaven is your home. And today we live with joy and peace and with full assurance to know that God is with us and he shut the door. The devil tried to keep it open. The devil tried to keep us out in sin. But I'm thankful that God led me in Holy Ghost conviction. You go study out the truth of this. That, that nowhere do you see Noah going out there and trying to coax those uh, animals to get inside the boat. The same Holy Ghost power that God drew those animals into that boat with is the same Holy Ghost power that God drew me with. You see, my daddy was a Christian and my mama was a Christian, but my daddy being saved and my mama being saved wasn't good enough for me to be saved, but I still remember trembling. I still remember old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction as the Holy Ghost got a grabbed a hold of my heart and began to deal with my soul. He showed me that I was lost, showed me I was on my way to hell, but I'm thankful he didn't leave me wounded. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, thank God. Somebody ought to thank God today for Holy Ghost conviction. It wasn't your plan. You didn't go looking after God. He come looking for you. For some of you, he come looking in a beer joint. For some of you, he came looking in a crack house. For some of you, he came looking in a church house. I don't care where you were. I don't care if you were a drug addict, a drunk, or a church kid. You needed the same amount of blood to save your soul as the worst in this town. But I am so thankful and I am so glad that the Holy Ghost has the power to draw us unto himself and for us to say yes to Jesus and for him to save our soul and to change our life. We see that he separated us from the wickedness. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The entire world is about to be destroyed by water. And as God repents himself that he had even made mankind, Noah went in with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And he takes them in. And the Bible says that when they had all come in, that the Lord shut them in. That word found 
in your King James Bible literally means this, grabbed. God grabbed Noah and put him inside the ark. Listen, for some of us, we think I was a very smart person the day that I found Jesus. We, I, I've said this. The best decision I've ever made was to say yes to Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not close to being a Calvinist. But hear me. I do believe in the working of the Holy Ghost in the aspect of salvation where it was not me that grabbed a hold of Jesus. It was Jesus that grabbed a hold of me. And Noah found grace. What's grace? Undeserved. When's the last time you were on this Christian journey that you're walking and recognized and realized how undeserving you are to be inside the boat with the door shut and thought, why in the world would God mess with a somebody like me? That's the person that'll have their hands raised that's the kind of person that can praise God when the doors get open and when the doors get shut. When you realize that if you got what you deserved, you would not even be on the boat in the first place. More or less arguing with God whether the doors open or close. God, humble us and get us back to a place where we can realize I don't deserve nothing. If, a matter of fact, if I got what I deserved, nobody in this room would want to talk to me. Nobody would want to hear me preach. Nobody would let me be a part of this family of faith. But thanks be unto God. The blood of Jesus cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And today I got a seat on the boat. I'm not going to whine about it. I'm not going to moan about it. I'm going to be glad. Yeah, there everything may not be the way I want it to be. It may not be perfect. I may not be perfect. But at the end of the day, honey, you got to realize the whole world is dying on the outside. But I got a seat on the inside. Thanks be unto God that he let me in. Separated them from the wickedness. Number two. To shelter them from the weather. Ministry number one is it separates us from the wickedness. There are doors that got shut in your life that you're mad at God over when all God was doing was separating you from the evil one and the wickedness of what could have happened to your life. Ministry number two is it sheltered them from the weather, Genesis chapter number 7 and verse number 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. I wrote this down in my study. Sometimes God will allow a trial that is designed only to keep you from a greater trial. Did you hear me? Sometimes God will allow a trial that is designed only to keep you from a greater trial. How silly do we look in the eyes of God when God in his complete sovereignty allows something into our life and it hurts, we don't like it, we heard the door shut, and we're saying, God, why? God, what have I done? Do you hate me, God? Do you even know where I am? Only for God to say, silly, would you please keep your mouth quiet just a little bit? If you could only see what I'm doing, I'm not punishing you. I'm protecting you. God, listen to the preacher, God loves you too much to just pointlessly hurt you. And many of the most hurtful seasons of my life, looking back, it was not God's punishment on my life. It was God's protection, provision, and even at times promotion that felt like a closed door. I remember when Becky and I were here. We were here serving and working with preacher. Everything was great. Everything was wonderful. God started stirring in my heart to be an evangelist. 
I'll never forget. I went in Preacher Brown's office, worked up the courage, and told him that God had laid it on my heart to do what I had seen in his giftings and start traveling and preaching. I did not find an encouraging pastor that day. Chris, he put them glasses on the tip of his nose, just like you've been doing lately too, by the way. Put them glasses right on the tip of his nose and said, you ain't going to be good at it. And he began to go down the road of telling me every reason why I shouldn't go, why I was crazy. Baptist people were going to starve me and Becky to death and all kinds of stuff talking me out of what I felt like God. And I remember those days being difficult. It wasn't until years and years and years later, he and I were preaching a meeting some years later together, and with tears in his eyes, he grabbed my leg. He said, boy, you're a good evangelist. Forgive me for that conversation we had in the office that one day. He didn't have to say that. But I remember in those days disconnecting from this ministry, feeling like we were walking away, uh, not understanding the fullness of everything that God had planned or what God was going to do, uh, not understanding the fullness and, and, and not having a, a steady paycheck here from the church and going out on faith and trusting God and going by faith to see what God had for our lives. And I remember in those days, it felt like God had just shut a chapter of our life that hurt us on the inside. I remember all of the emotions of those days when we left here. But looking back now, I see in full color that that wasn't God's chastisement on my life. That wasn't God being mad at me God said, well, you went to Larry Brown's Bible college. Now I need you to go to my Bible college. And it was on the backside of the desert that God was teaching me how to be a preacher. I would not be ready for today's assignment in my life if I hadn't been faithful to chase after God in that assignment of my life. And there are times when the door being shut will feel like God's mad at you. There are times when the door being shut will feel like God doesn't know where you are. But ladies and gentlemen, not only does God know where you are, he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about your life. And God does not just shut the door on you for no reason. Many times it's to shelter you from the weather. And when the rain begins to fall and the winds begin to blow and everything on the outside takes place, I promise you Noah and his family are mighty thankful that they had heard the voice of God, that they had built the ark of God, and now they are inside the ark with the door shut. Aren't you glad in this day and hour that God will shut doors in your life and that when the troubles and the trials of this life come by, you can know that you are exactly where you're supposed to be I wrote this down too I hope it'll be a blessing to somebody the will of God may not always be the most comfortable place but it will always be the safest place in the whole wide world are you directly in the center of the will of God here's another one everything out of my control is the center of the will of God. And I can either, I, and I've, done, I've had both sides of this in my life, I can get mad at God and cry at God. God, why would you allow this to happen? God, why would you make me lose my job? God, why would my body get sick? God, why would you let my marriage fall apart? God, would, why would you let my kid get on drugs? God, why would you let this? Or, and you can go as long as you want to go, but at the end of the day, you've got to take responsibility for what you can take responsibility of and then find peace and rest in the rest of the stuff and say, I didn't put myself here. I didn't bring myself here. If God's brought me to it, 
then God can take me through it and know that there's a God in heaven that has shut the door, but in the middle of God authorizing the shutting of that door, he will provide for you in that season. He will protect you in that season. And ain't no devil in hell can thwart the plan of God for your life. Ladies and gentlemen, let yourself be encouraged today. Don't let the devil rob you of your joy, of your Christian walk, and make you believe a lie that there's a devil that controls the plan of God. No, 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 no. The devil may have some power. But God has all power and my God's still seated on the throne and he's still in control and he knows what's going through. He's still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still El Shaddai. He's still the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the sweet rose of Sharon. And today as a child of God, you better know that you got a father that owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hill and he owns the oil under the hill. And it don't matter what the economy does. It don't matter what Washington, D.C. does. Ladies and gentlemen, my feet are upon the solid rock and I can be encouraged today that God has me right where he wants me. Ministry number one is it separates them from wickedness. Ministry number two is it sheltered them from the weather. Don't get out of that boat. Don't get out of that boat. You get out of an alignment of what God has for your life and you ain't never felt winds like you fixing the field. Then thirdly and lastly, it situated them for worship. It situated them for worship. With every closed door circumstance, there are two separate designs. For everything real that God has, the devil has a fake. There is the design of the devil. You say, what's the design of the devil? Well, it's, it's not in the Hebrew, but anybody with a little bit of sense can think through this. Noah and his wife and their sons and their three wives get on that boat with all them animals on that boat. And maybe on day one, they're having revival. On day two, they're living in the joy of the Lord. They're just thankful that they're still alive. But about day five or six or seven, on this boat, there ain't nary enough bathrooms on that boat for all them girls to get ready. There ain't enough power sources to plug in their blow dryers. And Elizabeth is mad at Jill because she's taking all the bathroom time and using the mirror all the time, which there wasn't hardly no light in there, but you know, anyhow. And, 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 and how many of y'all, we love to just act like these people were super spiritual all the time, but these people in this Bible were just like you and I. How many of y'all would bet that within 40 days, at some point in time, there was a royal family feud on that boat? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, there, some of y'all, you got to laugh to keep from crying. You know, that's my sink. Why you keep spitting your toothpaste in my sink and you don't clean your toothpaste before you... Yeah, y'all don't have Tucker in your house, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> why, why don't you lift up the lid? I'm just trying to point out all the stuff your family fights about in your house. 40 days on a boat. And then, the other design of the devil, all them animals eating every day. How many of y'all know that they don't have a bladder or the rest of the stuff that can just hold it for 40 days. And there was not really a little waste exiting on side the ark designed. I'm just trying to tell y'all that it stunk on that boat. There were bad attitudes probably on that boat. Sounds like a Baptist church sometimes, don't it? <laughs> and before you... People not getting their way. And man, people's frustrated on that boat. 
And there's a design of the devil in shut door situations to get everybody to turn on each other. There's a design of the devil in your marriage for the husband and wife to fight each other instead of the devil. There's a goal and design of the devil within every church for the church to stop fighting the devil and start inwardly fighting each other. There is a design of the devil to let little gossip rings start within a church. Designed to divide and destroy what God is doing. You can either work on God's team in the middle of a closed door situation, which only really has one verse, and that is study to be quiet. Or you can just pray along with the devil's plan and just be an active participant of the devil's plan. There is the design of the devil, and that's division in the midst of closed door situations, and we've all seen that. But that is not the goal of the devil. There's also the design of the divine. And in your Bible, in the creation and in the architecture of the ark, God not only told them to design it, the length, the width, and the height. I looked at it this morning, and this ark uh, was designed to be 450 feet long. 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. And in the center of this boat, God also, in Genesis chapter 6 and 16, told Noah this. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with the lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. In this ark, in the middle of what was known to be a stinky situation at times, God designed for there to be, they say that a cubit is roughly 18 inches, an 18-inch square window in the top of that boat. There were no cruise ship portholes out the side to see what was going on. They were blind to what was happening horizontally. The only aspect that God wanted them to look was up. This closed door circumstance has positioned them to worship. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot explain this to you. You would think that the people of God would worship the most when everything is wonderful in their life. But there is something so very special and unique about the child of God in the midst of hard circumstances, in the middle of stinky circumstances, that God will give us a window and many times it is foggy and it's cloudy where we can't see horizontally, but God will say, I don't want you looking horizontally. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look at the waves. Don't try to look at the wind. Don't look at the rain. Just find you a place and look up and learn how to worship me through the storm and through the trial because there and only there will you find trouble, will you find peace in the middle of your trouble. I wonder if there's anybody in the room that has found him to be a very present help in time of trouble. And when you could not look this way and you couldn't see that way and you could not see in front of you and you could not see behind you and you did not know what God was doing or where God was leading you, the only thing God would do would lead you to a place that even while you were hurting and even while you were rejected and even while you were in pain, you could find a place to look up and there in a spirit of worship Worship, you can find peace that passeth all understanding. Worship is not a Sunday thing. Worship is an everyday thing. Worship is not just an everyday thing. Worship is an every hour thing. And for the child of God that learns that the devil wants to rob you of your worship and rob you of your praise, you got to have a made up mind that when the devil knocks on your door on Monday and tells
tells you that everything is falling apart. You've got to be able to find you a place and it's not a telephone and it's not Facebook where you call the brothers and sisters and tell them to pray for you, although that ought to be fine. But before you get on Facebook and before you get on the telephone, there ought to be a place where you can go to that little 18 by 18 window and say, oh God, the devil stopped by the house today. I don't have a clue how I'm going to make it through, but God, by faith, I'm going to speak to the mountain because you've moved mountains before. You've brought me through valleys before. You've brought me through trouble before. And the same God that saw me through stuff last month is the same God that's going to bring me through stuff this month. And the same God that paid my bills last month is the same God that's going to pay my bills this month. The same God that touched my body two years ago is the same God that's going to touch my body today. The same God that was keeping me in my right mind yesterday is the same God that will keep me in my right mind today. The same God that gave me joy unspeakable yesterday is the same God that will give me joy unspeakable today. The same God that woke me up and put my feet upon the rock yesterday is the same God that will wake me up and put my feet on the rock tomorrow. Are you getting what I'm saying? you got to worship. It's not a feel-good worship. It's not waiting to worship till you feel good. We don't worship God on how we feel. We worship God on the facts. And the facts are that God's still seated upon the throne. And the facts are that the devil can't do nothing about God's power. The facts are the devil don't have no say in the plan of God for your life. And the facts are that heaven's a real place with streets of gold and gates of pearl. And the devil can't do a thing about the fact that my heart has been washed in the red blood of Calvary. My name has been recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And the facts are that he's still a healer. The facts are he's still a deliverer. The facts are he's still the God of all glory. The facts are he's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. The facts are he's the fourth man in the fire. The facts are he'll get in the middle of Daniel's line then with you. The facts are no matter how sick your body is, he's the healer. You talk to Lazarus and you'll find no matter how dead you are that he can say come forth and you got to come up out of the grave. I don't know what your mountain is. I don't know what your tomb is. I don't know what you're going through but I do know that he's a good God and he has the power and the ability to watch over you and to take care of you. I wish I had some people on Sunday February 25th that say I'm not out of my storm yet but I'm not going to wait till I feel good to praise him. I'm going to praise God on credit. I'm going to go ahead and praise him. I'm going to lift my voice. I'm going to give God glory. Before I get through the season, before I get out of the valley, I'm going to give him praise. I'm going to give him glory. Why? Because Paul and Silas were in the midst of the jail cell and it looked like they was going to die in the middle of that prison. But old Paul and Silas started singing praises unto God and something happened, y'all. The earth began to shake and the walls fell down and the shackles fell off there is power in your praise I said there's power in your praise hey mama praise God on credit for bringing your prodigal home hey daddy praise God on credit for putting your marriage back together it ain't over until God says it's over I'm about to die trying to preach it to you but I'm just trying to tell you it ain't over until God says it's over ask Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego ask Daniel ask all the people in the Bible where it looked like it was over, but it ain't over until God says it's over. Jerry trying to kill me so he can pastor the church. I know that's what he's doing. <laughs> I was praying early this morning. I said, Holy Ghost, remind me of a moment in my life when I had to practice what I'm preaching today. Yes. Becky, come here, baby. Several years ago, 
So sit down. <laughs> Her and Tucker got a deal that if I mention their name in a sermon or use them as illustrations, they said they get 15 bucks. <laughs> and last week when I called Tucker out in the balcony, he said, Dad, that was a $50 deal there. That was $50. <laughs> When you're in a preacher's family, you're just fair game. I said, Holy Ghost, remind me of when I had to practice what I'm preaching today. God saw fit to take our little son Cashton to heaven years ago. It wasn't long after Becky's mama died. It was a one-two punch, and I, I'd be honest that it threw us for a loop, Becky even worse than the rest of us. And I'll never forget in the funeral service of our little son, he died just right before Becky delivered him into this world. We had one goal and that was we wanted to go to church with our son one time. So we carried that little box into Trinity and Asheville. And all of our friends came in and we had church one time. The choir sang and we worshiped. The world doesn't understand that. Brother Ralph said, I'll, I'll do the preaching. You just sit with your wife. And early that morning, the, God, the Holy Ghost gave me one verse. And it was the verse about, I. he can't come back to me, but I can go to him. And I remembered a story that my Sunday school teacher told me when I was a little kid about the Holy Ghost and worship. He said they grew up in the coal camps of West Virginia. And he talked about those early days growing up in the mountains of West Virginia in that little coal camp, coal camp. And the building of those little shacks that they lived in. They didn't have the insulation and the stuff we have today. And he talked about in those winter months how the wind would howl and whip through those little shack of houses that they had in those coal camps. And he said at night with those little covers that he had, he said it would get blue cold to where he would remember as a little kid his teeth chattering, being so cold in that little shack of a house because the wind could just whip through the boards of that little shack of a house. And I remember to this day that Sunday school teacher teaching us as kids about who the Holy Ghost is and the power of worship. The Holy Ghost in your Bible is referred to as the Comforter. My Sunday school teacher said when he was a boy that his mother would take that Comforter and put that Comforter around him in the middle of the night. And he said, the comforter being on did not stop the winds from blowing. And it didn't stop the rains from falling. But it did cover him to the point where the wind was not a factor anymore. And in one of the lowest days of our lives, I had Becky do sitting on the front row and I got a big comforter and I made my wife a promise that I don't know how we got here. I don't know why God chose it to be this way but that the God and the Holy Ghost that our parents had raised us to believe in in the midst of this trial the Holy Ghost and worship in the middle of turbulent days and troublesome days 
when you feel so exposed to the elements and all the pain and all the emotions of all the troubles and trials, the Holy Ghost, in the middle of your choice to worship, will come by and... Am I messing up my illustration now, babe? <laughs> How many of y'all have parents that would tuck you in real good? So that there was no place for the winds to get around that comforter. That's how worship is. It's not a feel-good moment. Worship is something we put on. And when we come to church, I hope, I hope, I hope that you get past just coming and staying and then leaving. But understand that you were designed for worship. You were designed to make noise. You were designed to praise God. The angels had to do it because it's what they were designed, but God gave us a free will, and God designed us to be worshipers. And all oh, that you and I would learn the power of when we don't understand, instead of complaining, if we would raise our hands and say, God, I trust you today. God, I praise you today. I worship you today. And even if you don't feel good in the moment, praise him for what he has done and what he has brought you through. Praise him that he's God before you got here. He'll be God while you're here, and he'll be God after you're gone. And something happens in the middle of praise, and something happens in the middle of worship where the Spirit of God will take over and will comfort you and cover you, and the winds are still blowing. The storm is still there. The sickness may still be there, but how many of you have learned by now? But in worship, God will cover you with his mercy and his grace and his power, and the winds will not affect you like they once did. I got to ask you, and I'm done. When's the last time you worshiped? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about when's the last time you asked God for something. I'm talking about the last time you come to God without your list and said, Lord, I want to thank you for salvation in my soul. I want to thank you for shoes on my feet. I want to praise you for clothes on my back. I want to praise you for a good family. I want to praise you for a church to go to. I want to praise you for breath in my lungs. I want to praise you for health in my body. I want to praise you for enough money in the bank to feed my family this week. I want to praise you for a job. I know I get. I, I know there's frustrations at the job. I know that I may not like everything, but God, I want to thank you that I'm not on unemployment this week. Thank you, God, for a job. Thank you for my home. Thank, you, you've got two choices. You can go down the negative lane or you can go down the positive lane. The negative lane will never lead you to worship, but the positive lane, when you rise up in your heart and say, God has been too good to me up until this point for me to stay silent and for me to stay quiet. I'm making up my mind today. Ain't no rock going to steal my praise. God may have shut a door. People may have walked out on you. People may have hurt you. Circumstances may have been shut. Instead of getting mad at God, how about you praise him for it? And say, God, I want to thank you that you're smarter than I am. You see further than I see. You know more than I know. And I'm going to let God shut those doors. And until he opens another door, one old preacher said like this, and until he opens another door, I'm going to praise God in the hallway. Because he's a door that shuts doors. He's a God that shuts doors no man can open. And he opens doors no man can shut. Can we praise God that he's a God that has the miracles of closed doors? Heads are bowed all over the church. How many Christians would say, Preacher, you touched on some stuff that was kind of close to home for me today. I've been walking through a closed door situation. Preacher, pray for me that I would handle it right. Pray for me that I can praise God through my closed door. Hands are all over the room. Thank you. These altars are open for you today. While Christians are praying, I wonder would there be anybody that would say, Pastor CT, you lost me on the first point because truth is if I was to die today, 
I'm not 100% sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. Pastor CT, would you please pray for me? I won't embarrass you. But if you're here and you say, preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'm saved, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you just slip a hand up right now, right where you are? Preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'm saved. There's one, there's two. Would there be another preacher? Please pray for me. I'm not 100% sure I'm saved. I see that hand, I see that hand. Would there be another right before I pray? Preacher, I see that hand, sir, thank you. Preacher, please pray for me. I'm not 100% sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I see that hand, young man, thank you. The word of God said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not my little memorized words that'll save you. It must come from the honesty of your heart. But right here, right now, in this moment, every one of you that raised your hands and everyone that should have raised your hands, I want you to have an encounter with God right where you are. I want you to pray right where you are. He's listening. I want you to say something like this. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I need to be saved. Please forgive me of my sin. I repent and I turn towards you. Please save me. Please forgive me. Please change me. Shut the door in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. This is my favorite part of church on Sundays. The Bible is very clear. It says if we're ashamed of him before men, he'd be ashamed of us before the Father. And I believe if you just got saved and you meant business with God, this is not going to be a problem. Right where you are, right here and now. He gave his life for you on the cross. All I'm going to ask you to do is this, is if you just prayed and meant business with God, right here, right now, unapologetically and unashamedly, I want you to hold your hand in the air until I tell you to take it down. One, two, three. Throw those hands in there. Preacher, I just prayed and asked Jesus to save me. Hold them up. Don't take them down. Hold them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Church, can we praise God for these eighteen who called on the name of Jesus? Listen to me. Keep those hands up. I'm sending ushers to you right now. I'm sending ushers to you right now. I need more up ushers up front, guys, as quick as you can. I'm sending ushers to you right now. They're putting a form in your hand. I want to be able to pray for you. They will hand you a free book from me to let you know how to get started on your walk with Christ. I want you to fill that out and give it back to one of these men so that I can pray for you this week and we can help disciple you as you start your walk with Christ. One more time, let's praise God in the name of Jesus for a wonderful day in God's house. Bless his holy name. And for every church member in this place that's facing a closed door situation, you can beat yourself up, lose all your joy, or you can trust God. And I'm challenging you to trust God with your closed doors. How many glad to see some soldiers give their heart to Jesus today? Isn't that a blessing?